chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And bringing a message that says, Wise men still seek Him. Wise men still seek Him. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when you have found him, bring me word again, that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed, and another star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were coming nigh into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented in him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned of a God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed in their own country another way. We are fully into the Christmas season, I hope, by this time. I pray that people are full of cheer and joy and that as we have went about purchasing our Christmas <coughs> gifts, and those things that were given away, that we exuded a good Christian spirit, and that wherever we went, uh, we didn't get too upset, too frustrated, but if we did, we still presented a good Christian spirit. In this Christian season, we come to the place that next Sunday, which is Christmas Day, we will celebrate the birth of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. The birth of Jesus is represented by two narratives. The narrative given by the wise men and the narrative of the shepherds. Today we want to see it from the perspective of the wise men. In Matthew chapter 1 we'll see the genealogy of Jesus. Now it's very important when you read the genealogy that you will see and trace that Jesus is in the lineage of David. He is the king the Messiah, the Anointed One. And so they trace it in Matthew's Gospel how he is in the line of Judah's lineage. Now, Jesus, of course, was born to Joseph and Mary. Mary was with child conceived of the Holy Ghost. And Joseph, being a just man, pondered privily how he was going to put her down. The law said if a virgin became pregnant, she was to publicly be stoned to death. Joseph, loving her, privately thought about doing a private stoning to kill her. When the angel of the Lord appeared and told her, I told him that that which was in Mary had been conceived by the Holy Ghost, that his name would be Jesus and that he would be the Savior because he was saving his people. This truth. Wise men still seek to know God, to worship him, and give themselves to him. If we want to be wise this morning, then we need to follow what these wise men did. Wisdom comes in knowing God. Wisdom comes in worshiping and serving God. And worship, uh, wisdom comes in giving ourselves totally and com completely to the hand of God in our life. 
Wise men still know him, seek to know him. When Jesus came, wise men came from the east to find him. These were men of knowledge. They had studied the stars. And stars appeared in their belief when a king was being born. And so they saw the star of a king, and they recognized from the writings that it was a star for the king of the Jews. These were educated men. Now the importance of this, as we will understand, is that God shows no respect of persons. He also comes to those who are knowledgeable. Next week we'll see the shepherds. How that he comes to even the very poor and lowly. So God is a God of all men, of all statures. Now when we begin to look at this, we begin to understand that these men were obviously Gentiles because they said they came to find the king of the Jews. If they were Jewish, they would say, we came to find our king. But they were from the east. They were not from Jerusalem. They were not from Israel. They were wise men from the east. Secondly, the Jews never called their leaders wise men. They called them rabbis, scribes, chief priests. So we assume, therefore, that these were Gentiles. And because they were Gentiles, it shows us that even at the birth of Jesus, Jesus was coming to save both Jew and Gentile. He was the Savior of all people. Amen. I am so glad that God in Jesus Christ is Savior of all. All that will believe. All that will accept what He did at Calvary. All that will confess Him and receive Him as Lord and Savior. These men left their country and traveled a great distance to find and know this King. They wanted to know who He was. They wanted to know all about Him. And I submit to you today that wise men today seek to know Him. We ought to be wise. We ought to be people of the book. Amen? We ought to know this book. I'm reminded of the little child. The pastor was coming, the preacher was coming to the house. And Mama got all busy. She cleaned the house up. She went and dusted off the Bible. And uh, she said to the child, Son, because she wanted to make a good impression on the preacher, Son, go get that favorite book of ours and, and show the preacher. So the kid comes in with a catalog from Sears. <laughs> Busted. Amen. <laughs> Wouldn't it be sad if Jesus came to visit us and found dust on our Bibles? Wouldn't it be sad if Jesus came to visit us and all he saw was a new Bible and there was no folded pages. There was no sense of showing that the Bible had ever been opened. You see, we open that Bible there and it's kind of more of a dress thing as anything. And yet some people do that. They put the family Bible out and it's there. But nobody ever reads it. Nobody ever studies it. We as children of God, if anything we do this year, we need to commit ourselves as students of the Word to read and study God's Word. How else are you going to know how you're supposed to act? How else are you going to know how you're supposed to treat people? How else will you be able to develop the nature of Christ within you? Because it's all contained in the Bible. Remember, we're supposed to be dying to the old Adamic nature. We're supposed to be dying to the old man. The Bible teaches us to put off the old man. In other words, it's, it's a, a metaphor that's talking about taking off dirty clothes. Isaiah said, of all our righteousness is like filthy rags. 
So God is saying to us, we have to put off that old man, his old thinking, his old behavior, the old places he used to go. And sometimes you have to put off old friends, particularly if those old friends want to drag you down. You say, well, what about their salvation? Listen, I've seen a lot of my old friends that when I kind of separated myself from them and then began to pray for them, they came to the Lord because they saw a difference. They saw a difference. Yeah. You see, if your friend sees you moseying up on the bar stool to drink a beer with him, he doesn't see no change. If he sees the same filthy mouth, he hasn't seen a change. You see, when Jesus comes in, He comes in to clean the house. He comes in to change us unto His blessed image. Amen? So in doing so, what do we do? Well, our thinking's got to change. Amen? You know what one of the thinking and things that happens is? That when you're fully committed to God, you're fully committed to love as God does. And when you're committed to love as God does, guess what? Self has to die. Self has to die. Because most of us grow up and love each other. You know, we love ourselves. Amen? Amen? But there comes a place where we have to love others greater than ourselves to show Jesus in their life. Now, the wise men also came to worship him. That was their purpose. When they saw King Herod, they said, we want to see the king of the Jews. We have come to worship him. That was their designated plan. We want to worship this king. Now, if you're a king sitting on the throne, and somebody says that we're coming to find the king of the Jews, and you happen to be the ruler over the Jews... Your knees knock. Who is this king? Because this king may convince the Jews to overthrow him. So Herod being a sly old fox says to the wise men after he's called his wise men he wanted to know where he was born. And his priest and the scribes came and said well now the scripture says he's going to be born in Bethlehem of Judea. And so he sent, Herod sent the wise men to Bethlehem to find this king with the purpose of go find him and come back and tell me. Well, I want to worship him too. Well, that's not what he wanted to do. He wanted, and we find out later, he wanted to kill the child. And he does. He does kill other children when the wise men do not go back and tell him. Two years and under. From the time that he figured that the wise men were there and the child was born, two years and under were killed by him, trying to kill the king of the Jews. But God was wiser than that. The baby was saved. He was in Egypt. And fulfillment of the scripture that out of Egypt God would call. Now, when they were released from Herod, once again that star was there. And they began to follow the star. And the star stopped over where the house, the Bible says, where the child was. At this point, this is later than the shepherd's narrative. The shepherd saw the baby in the manger, wrapped in swaddling clothes. It was a baby. But at this point, it's a child. Now, we don't know how old and how long it took the wise men to get there to follow that star. Herod thought two years. What we do know, he's no longer in the stable. He's in the house with his parents. And so they came into the house and they saw the child. Note, as you read the scriptures, that Jesus' name always comes before Mary. He always makes a reference to Jesus before Mary. And then Joseph finally gets in there. He must have really felt like the, the third wheel. 
It says he's always mentioned last. But he came and he saw the child and Mary. <clears throat> they came into the house. They fell down, which was a normal way of worship, and worshiped him. Amen. These three wise men fell down and worshipped him. Wise men today, if you're wise, still seek to worship God. Amen. I'm not talking about going through a litany or a liturgy. I'm talking about your spirit getting in contact with the presence of God and your spirit bowing before Him and worshiping Him. He says we must worship Him in spirit and in truth. So when we come together, we need to first cast all our cares upon Him for He cares for us. Because if we're thinking about our cares all through the worship service, we're not worshiping. We're worrying. So the very beginning, whatever is happening your, during your week, good, bad, ugly, it don't matter. Cast it upon the Lord when you come into the house of God. Give it to God to start with and leave it there. And free up your soul and your spirit to worship God. Because when your spirit and soul is free, guess what? God will speak to you. God will speak to you through His small, still voice. He'll speak through you through His Word. He'll speak to you through a song. If you are concentrating and focusing and worshiping God, you can hear the voice of God. For my sheep know my voice, and they'll not follow another shepherd. Amen? God says you know His voice. So we have to listen. But sometimes the conflicts of everything around us become so noisy. If we don't quiet our hearts, we'll never hear them. Have you ever tried to carry on a conversation and the TV blasting? TV going? And you got somebody over here and you got somebody over here and the TV's going? You can't hear a thing. You can't carry on a conversation. <coughs> you have to quiet things down. To you ever try to walk with somebody and all that's going on is trucks coming by and all the noise of ambulances and stuff and you're trying to talk to them while you're walking with them it's hard to hear you got to listen closely and so it is when we come into the house of God and we come to worship him we need to quiet our hearts before him and say Lord what are you wanting to tell me today what am I to learn today? And I submit to you, every time you come into the presence of God, it's a learning time. It's a time for you to get knowledge. It's a time for God to speak to you. It's a time for your hurts to be healed. Your sins to be forgiven. And your joy to be made full in Christ Jesus. Finally this morning, these wise men still offer gifts. The wise men presented to this child gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now let me hasten to say right here, it is from these gifts that scholars deduce that they are three wise men. And it was because of the richness of the gifts, they call them kings. Now let me ask you a question. In the scripture we read, did it say three wise men came from these? Or did it say wise men? Did it say three kings came from the east? Or did it just say wise men? I want to tell you it's really irrelevant whether it's three wise men or two wise men, three kings, no kings, that's irrelevant. What is relevant is they came to
to worship God. They came to worship the king. Now, where did we get that? Well, we got that from the early church fathers. The early church fathers and some of the historians said there were three wise men because there was three gifts. And then they said, took it further and said, well, there are three kings. Well, now you can sing a song that tells you the names of the wise men. The church fathers gave them a name. But it's not in the scriptures. And that's all right. That, that's no problem. Whether you want to call them, you know, Billy Bob and Joe. The important is they were wise enough to worship God and to give Him gifts. Matthew, in bringing these wise men to our knowledge, wants to show that all people of all nations acknowledge sometime Jesus as King of the Jews, and they came to worship Him as God. Now, the early church fathers went a step further and said the goal, because Jesus holds the office of prophet, priest, and king, that's three of the roles he does in his act as Savior and Redeemer. They understood the goal to symbol Christ's deity, represent him as king. They took the incense, which was a symbol of purity, to represent his office as a priest, because the priest offered incense in the temple. And the myrrh represented his suffering and death for the sins of the world, but it also represented judgment, which was his place as a prophet. Wise men, truly wise men and women, still to seek God to offer gifts to them. But the best gift that anyone can give God and the best gift that God wants is you and me. He wants us to give ourselves completely and fully and totally to Him. Didn't I tell you one, maybe it was last week, that sometimes our will gets us into trouble. Did not even Jesus have to pray in the garden, Father, not my will, but thy will be done? It is that free will that gets a lot of Christians into trouble. They <laughs> walk away from God's divine will, and they follow their own will. And then they ask God to clean up the mess. We need to surrender our will to God. How can I do that? It's just very simple. Whenever you are making a decision, whatever that decision is, whether it's financial, whether it's relationship-wise, whatever it is, always pray, Father, not my will, but thy will be done. Now, if you pray that way, guess what? Whatever comes your way, you'll accept as the will of God. And you won't be crying unto God, well, why didn't you do it my way? Amen? You see, we can't do like Frank Sinatra and sing, I did it my way. Amen? <laughs> Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. we got to do it His way. Yeah. we got to do it His truth. we got to do it His life. By the way, thank God I haven't been able to do that in many, many weeks. Uh, we show ourselves to be wise men when we seek to know more about God through His Word in personal experience. As we come to know God, we need to change. Coming to know God will change the way we think. Will change the way we talk. Will change the way we behave. Will change the places that we visit. It will change our values. <clears throat> and every change that God makes in us is always the best change around. We further show ourselves to be wise men when we seek Him with all our being, spirit, soul, and body, to worship Him. God wants not just our mind. There are a lot of people today 
who have an intellectual relationship with God. They only have accepted what he said in their head. But no changes. They live the same way. I want to tell you, when you truly have a personal experience with God, you'll be a new creation. You won't be the same. You won't think the same way. Amen? You'll love people more. You'll love to want to do more for people. Amen? Somehow, when we truly get a hold of God, and God gets a hold of us, self dies, and Christ arises. And we love everybody. Amen? Rich, poor, it don't matter. Black, white, green, yellow, it don't matter. Educated, uneducated, it don't matter. The love of God in us will love them. And guess what? When we truly love the way God loves, we'll love our enemies. And we'll learn to feed our enemies. And we'll learn to water our enemies. And in doing so, we'll heap coals of fire upon their head. Amen. You see, people are not one to Christ through argument. They are one to Christ through the love of God. Love people. Love them into the kingdom. True wisdom finally comes when we offer ourselves as gifts to Him to serve and worship Him. You have not properly worshipped God if when you get to leave this place, you don't feel like you need to go serve somebody. You come into worship, get filled up, get new fuel, get new fire, but you leave to serve God so that others may know the God you know and know that He is alive. He's no longer in the tomb. Death could not hold Him. Satan is defeated in Jesus Christ. We are alive in Him, and He is alive forevermore. Amen. Amen. So this morning, as I challenge you in this worship, let's get ready to worship and serve Him. Our brother is coming.